Welcome everybody. I'm Scott Patton. This is free eBooks. Well, this is Books Cafe brought to you by free-ebooks.net. And each week we're going to be talking to people who can help you publish a book if you want to be an author or people who are authors. And we're going to talk about their experience in publishing their book. And of course, we'll get them to share. If you, uh, if you're seeing this anywhere, like, share, subscribe so you don't miss anything. And because we're going live, if you ask questions, guess what? We could actually answer them on the air. So if you've got any questions, make sure you ask them. All right. So my guest today, I'm really excited. I've known him for about three or four years and uh, awesome, awesome guy. And he's the marketing guy behind BC Stack. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, really, really well during our talk. And he started blogging concentrated and finding joy.net. So he's a very joyous person. He helps people launch and market their books, get published deals, grow their audience. He's gotten clients on the Today Show, the cover of magazines, and hundreds and hundreds of podcasts. Like, yay, I think that's awesome getting people on podcasts. And what fascinates me, and one of the reasons I was so excited that he would join us, is he self published his own book. He's got a deal with a vanity publisher, and he's published with a big publishing house. So he's done kind of the big three when it comes to books. So with that, join me, everybody, in welcoming Dan R. Morris. How are you doing, Dan? Was I, I thought maybe there'd be like, you know, a plug. Yeah, I thought there'd be that, you know, the, the little button. Okay. Yeah, so everybody give him a little love, you know, hit the like button or the... Uh, it's a like button. I think that's all we've got it on. Hit the hand applause button. So what did you self-publish first and then do the vanity and then get a, a big, huge, multi-billion dollar publishing deal at one of the big publishing houses? Or how did that process work? Well, um, you know, while you're doing things, it doesn't seem like a process. It seems like you're just doing things. So looking back, I can see that we definitely took steps. Um, so Rachel Martin, my wife, she runs findingjoy.net, which is a, a big motherhood blog. You know, now she gets 50,000 to 100,000 people to her blog a day. And her Facebook page has half a million people. And, you know, it's a, it's a big site at this point. Uh, but about seven years ago, we started getting people asking if she would take her blog posts uh, if there was a way for them to print them. Like, do you have a PDF? Do you have, do you have them together? So, right. so for her, she just kept telling me like, you know, we're getting people asking if they can print them. And I said, all right, well, if people are want to print them, why don't we take all of the blog posts that have a particular theme and turn them into a book? Now, she had a, a theme within her blog called Dear Mom Letters. So she would write a letter to, like, because a motherhood blog, so she would write, you know, to the mom who is stressed and dear mom who feels like she's failing. So we took that, that series and we turned them into a book. Now, then we sold it for seven ninety nine, dollars um, And she sold thousands, thousands of them. Nice. And she even wanted to sell them for two ninety nine because she didn't think that people would spend seven ninety nine. But I thought we can always go down, right? Right. Always right. use the price, <laughs> but you can't go back up, really. Like, hey, it's five ninety nine. Suddenly it's eleven. Like that's not as easy. Um, so, right. so that works great. Now the process for that wasn't necessarily just copy paste. Um, it, it is copy paste, but you also want to make it look good because more than anything, anytime that you sell something, you're pretty much your one and only goal should be to, to get them to buy it the next one, right? Like that's your goal. Make it so good that they want to buy the next one. So if we just took the blog posts and then, you know, put them in a word doc and pressed, you know, print a PDF, you know, I don't, I don't think that would work from our right. ending perspective. So we had to add, you know, imagery and uh, we took the images from the blog and then, you know, we kind of massaged it and made it look good. I think we actually hired someone 
on Fiverr for maybe a hundred bucks or something up to format it and to make it look like a book. Um, only because sometimes when you're starting something, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And you don't always have all the skills you need, but the good thing about the world we live in is there are people that do have it and it's not that hard to find them. Yeah. You know, like even the word page bleed, I didn't really know what that meant at that time. Mm. I didn't have that kind of knowledge in my head. Like I didn't understand uh, the margin rules. Um, and with ebooks, it's not that big a deal, but with like a Kindle book, it's got to be formatted in a way that the words can shift as the screen size. So it can't necessarily be a PDF. So sometimes you do have to outsource your brain to Fiverr or somebody who's done that before and then uh, just realize, look, I'm going to use the, their knowledge because I don't really want to make a mistake because I didn't know what question to ask. Um, so that became my ebook. Um, and that one still sells on her site, the Dear, Dear Mom Letters. Uh, and actually, on the page, the sales page, because uh, some people are worried about this. Like, why would people buy it if they could just read it for free? But on the sales page, on her site, we actually say, we have compiled the blog posts that you could readily read for free and put them into this ebook. And people still are totally fine because um, you're often willing to pay to get something into a format you like or to make it more convenient. To, so you can read offline, for instance. Um, so don't don't necessarily think people won't buy if it's already free, because um, because people will. There's always a there's always someone that could need it in a different way, and it's and if it's worth it, then they'll do it to them. Yeah, I, I, there is two parts to what you were just saying that I thought was really interesting. We and I think the majority of us have these types of issues. One is we undervalue what it is that we create. Right, like you said, we went seven ninety nine, but we really were thinking about two ninety nine, and I think everybody goes through that. And the other thing is that people will pay for convenience. In fact, that's usually what we do is we pay for convenience, right? And that's yeah. what you did. You said, you know what, we're going to have to format this. We wanted to make it look nice. Uh, we don't know where this is necessarily going, but we just don't want to make a, a word doc with a bunch of words on it that you know because it's not going to have the same feel. And, yeah. and the energy that your blog posts have. So you could spend, you know, three years going to graphic design school and book publishing school and page bleed school and, and all that stuff. Or you could just go someplace like Fiverr or Upwork and find somebody that's done it and that can do it for you. And then you go through that experience as a team, right, where you have people that do. And this is what happens in, I mean, the, the guy that owns the book publishing company, he doesn't, you know, typeset the books and he doesn't run the printers and he doesn't run the binding. He's got people that do all of that. And I think as solo entrepreneurs or duo entrepreneurs in your case, yeah. uh, you know, we, we sometimes think, well, oh, we got to do it all. And it's, it's really not, it's not, uh, it's not the way to do it. So I think that's a really great story. Did you end up doing a series of books? Um, no, but that's a different story. Okay. Let me come to that one in just a second. Sure. So I was going to say something about convenience because this happened yesterday and it was on the forefront of my mind, not thinking that we were going to have this conversation, but uh, I was at the gas station and my wife said, can you get me a Coke? And I was going to go in and get a Coke for myself. And I was next to the machine where, where you pull the handle and you, know, you fill the, what do you call that? Fountain drinks. Um, right. And the, the fountain, fountain machine. The fountain drink was 79 cents, you know, for a really big fountain drink. And they had exactly what she wanted. They had Coke and Cherry Coke. And I looked at it and I thought, ah, 79 cents, but it doesn't have a lid. Like it doesn't have a screw top. Mm. So I actually walked over to the fridge section and opened the door and paid dollar nineteen for less soda that had a screw top. <laughs> I, knew, I knew it in my brain. I was like, oh, this is the dumbest thing, but I totally want to be able to close it. Yeah. So, well, and the thing is, is that like you were saying, that's convenience, but it's um, now I lost my thought. <laughs> it 
we we want to we want it to be a certain way, and we're willing yeah. to pay extra for it. And what I was going to say was, oftentimes we think like, what's forty cents? And in some ways, it's it's a lot, and in some ways, it's 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 insignificant, right? Yeah. When we because we often will do things where it's called like tolerance, right? We'll tolerate things that we shouldn't tolerate because it's going to take an hour to fix it. And, but every week or every day we have this, this irritation because of something we're tolerating that we shouldn't. And I think it's really important that we look at how do we make life go smoothly, right? Yeah. So you take the uncapped bottle, the two uncapped bottles into your car, you're driving along and all of a sudden you have to slam on your brakes and the two bottles go flying through the, the interior of your car spewing Coca-Cola over everything. Now you've got a massive problem yeah. that you wouldn't have had if you'd spent the $40, right? 40 cents. 40 cents. So, 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 he, so there was another topic that I thought came up and that was spending $100 for somebody to format it into a book when you're just starting is like, how do I, how do I spend the money? Like I haven't even made the money yet. Or, or maybe even I don't even have the money, right? Like, like a hundred dollars a lot for some people. So here's why it makes sense. And it didn't, it didn't for a long time. Like I didn't, I didn't think this way. Um, if I pay someone a hundred dollars to go format this book, who will do it better than me. And they'll do things that I, I didn't know how to do, like, like paginate per, perhaps the right way, or you know, make the captions to the image inside of the little frame so it actually looks cool. Like, I might not have been able to do that, and it won't be as good a book without doing it. But I do know from BC Stack, our our flagship product, that if I can take myself out of the book formatting. And then actively put myself into the marketing. So let's just say this person's going to take three days, right? Which means you were going to take six if you were going to do it because you're, you're hiring somebody who can do it faster. Um, so that means that you have three days in my head to really work hard. And if you're selling your book for $2, let's just say, then you got to figure out how in three days can I find 50 more buyers of my book so that in my head I can balance, look, I just made a hundred dollars doing marketing. Well, I spent a hundred dollars to make, to make the book look better. Like if you can figure out how in your head, like this is what I have to do to pay for that and then do it. Then I think you'll create for yourself a new habit of, of outsourcing, which will allow you to do more things because finding 50 buyers means, a lot more people are going to know about it. It's probably going to be more than 50. So you're going to actually make more money than it costs you to, to hire the person to do the book. So if you can somehow create a balance sheet in your head, like, okay, for three days, I was going to be doing that. How do I just spend my time making a hundred dollars? If you could do that, then I, then you'll be way better off in the, in your publishing world, your journey, because you'll soon start to figure out, well, wait, now I can have this person, you know, turn this into a course. Like now I've got an upsell. Now I've got these other things. Whereas if you stay in the place of I have to do everything on my own because I don't have money, then you're really limited by your time. And you'll never like break out of you'll never break out of that mindset. So if you could just do a simple thing, like spend a hundred dollars on Fiverr while you find 50 buyers. And that might mean and we're gonna talk about this, I guess coming up, but if your book is about um, crochet, you're, you're writing a book about crochet, then maybe you have to figure out, all right, in the next three days, I need to join like, I don't know, 30 groups that have to do with crochet. Like I need to get involved or I need to contact, find people who have a crochet audience, contact them, tell them about the book that I'm, that I'm building uh, ask them if they would like a copy, see if they would like a copy in exchange for telling their audience about the book. Like if you could totally focus on that for the same three days that the person is uh, is working on your book, you, you'll just end up in a whole new place in your head. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. 
And, and I agree because I came from that place of trying to do everything myself. And I'm switching now. I've got a team of eight VAs doing different things. And I have to tell you, it is such a load when you've got people that are better at you, better than me doing things that I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then it gets done fast because I can be doing something, you know, I, whatever it happens to be. And, and then I turn around and, oh, that's done. And it's yeah. just like, it's, it's a wonderful feeling, right? And I think, I think you really, you have to really look at what is your job right in your case you're talking about i'm going to get you know x number of sales for my book and then that will pay for that person and and if we realize what we're supposed to be doing as opposed to what we maybe think we should be doing or the tasks that get in the way of us doing what we really need to do because i see it all the time with with people that in i, I would say entrepreneurs more than authors because i see more of them but they get stuck in this there's a like a glass ceiling because you just you've got 24 hours in a day you have to sleep you have to eat and then you and then you can't get you get interrupted and you can't get anything done and uh, that's now, awesome if the idea of going out and getting 50 more sales scares you then in my head you haven't done one of two things you either don't know your book well enough or you don't know how your book helps people. So if your book is going to give better, uh, better patterns for crochet or a better way or, you know, something, something that actually helps people, then you just have to find people who have that problem and tell yeah. them, Hey, I've created the solution for you. It's in this, it's in this book. Um, but if you, if you haven't figured that part out, then, then you haven't really figured out either your audience or your book. You got to do one of the two and you got to get to a point where you know exactly the problem that people have and, and that which you're solving. Because once you yeah. find people with that problem, as long as you understand that you can solve it, you should be able to sell your book without any problem. Um, and that even, right. that's a comedy book too. Like maybe you're writing a satirical book, but um, you just need to figure out who resonates with the satire and then, who resonates in like maybe people are depressed, maybe people are upset or they're overcoming something or they're overwhelmed. Like who's this group of people that would read your book and it would just like totally lighten their load, it would make them feel better about life and you just define them. Like, hey, I know you're feeling overwhelmed. I wrote this book. I think you're going to love it. I used to have a job just like yours. I talk about it in the book. It may, it'll make you laugh. You know, like it doesn't matter what kind of book it is as long as you know what it does for someone and who it is that it will work for. Then right. you just have to find them. Yeah, build and building your community. So that brings me kind of to my next question for you. Like, what's your favorite way of growing an audience for a book? So for a book, I think some people go about this the wrong way. Um, and I am actually one of those people right now. I'm going about my project the, the wrong way. And I already know that. And so right now I'm in the process. I started a podcast and the podcast is based on my love of Paul Harvey. I used to absolutely love Paul Harvey, the radio guy. I love his stories. So I created this podcast that's based on the kinds of stories that he would tell. And so I tell the same kinds of stories. But at no time prior to this moment have I ever started to create an audience of people who like Paul Harvey or Charles Kuralt, uh or any of the other storytellers. So I'm going to go from being this guy who helps, who helps bloggers and podcasters and vloggers uh, turn their hobby into a career. And then I'm just going to suddenly take a right turn and then start marketing this podcast for people who like Paul Harvey stories. But I don't have that. I don't have the audience. So it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would I go this direction without starting the audience? So some of you, like like Rachel, she's got an audience of half a million moms, and we write motherhood books. It totally makes sense, right? Uh, but now I gotta figure out, well, how do I create an audience of people who like Paul Harvey and want to hear more stories like that? Because at this point in time, only you 
on this call pretty much know that I have a podcast about Paul Harvey. <laughs> And when you think about it, there are millions and millions of people that would just wait for when he came on to listen for the rest yes. of the story. So I use um, I use a service, a name of which I cannot remember. I use a service. What's it called? It's like Google Alerts. Oh, my. So there's a service called Google Alerts, and it's it will come to me, the one I actually use. Will come to me here in a second. It's on the tip of my tongue. Um, so basically, I tell Google Alerts anytime anyone mentions the word Paul Harvey on the internet, I would like to know. Anytime anyone mentions the word Charles Crawl on the on the internet, I would like to know. So every day, I get an email from Google Alerts that says, "Hey, here's somebody t tweeted that said I like Paul Harvey," and I get to go. I click on it. I go directly to that tweet which was just tweeted in the last eight hours. And I get to say, dude, I love Paul Harvey too. That's why I created my podcast. Like, that's just a simple, like a simple, easy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or, Google Alerts is great. I'm not, I don't know which one you're using, but I use that for a number of things. And it's, you get yeah. the, well, it's for news. I use it for news. So. So you can pick any name. So we have our own names. Cause like Rachel, yep. I want to know anytime anyone ever mentions Rachel's name. Cause right. her, are used so we have we must have 50 alerts for every quote we want to make sure nobody's stealing the quotes and all this stuff but every day we get these emails that say hey here's where your name was mentioned in these 500 places um, so so that's a, a good way to at least reach people in a timely manner who are thinking about the thing that you're actually trying to sell um, but right. the, the most important part is you have to know who you're trying to reach not my book is for women. Like that's not a thing. No, there's all kinds of women, um, and it's not my book is for forty-year-old women because there's lots of those too. So you got to figure out who who is your book for. Like that's the most important part. And then I don't know if you've heard the word authentic online before, but I think people misuse it. Authentic. No, I've never heard of that word before. Actually, <laughs> people. People say be authentic online. And I think most people think that means like be honest or be yourself. But that's that's not what it means. What it means is everything that you do online should be totally related to the way that your book helps people. So mm -hmm. if you're going to do an Amazon gift card giveaway for somebody to you know register here to, to win a book and an Amazon gift card, um, like that is in no way associated with your book. So all right. of a sudden, it's not associated with any book, anything. So right. you have to start creating this list. People are going to come to your Facebook page. They're going to like your thing in order to be eligible to win this Amazon gift card. And it's not going to matter because if your site is about menopause, I'm still going to go there to try to win this gift card. And I don't, I don't care. Right. About so, you want to make sure that everything that you do, your Twitter description, your LinkedIn description, your giveaways, they're totally related to the purpose of your business or your book. So if you're going to give something away, instead of an Amazon gift card, then give away uh, a 30-minute session with you talking about this thing, how you help people do this, or a pre-recorded webinar where you explain A, B, and C, but it's totally related to your book because then the only people who will sign up who are people who are interested in that thing in the first place. And then you'll start creating a real audience of people who actually care about the thing that you do and not a fake audience of people who just wanted to win a gift card and then they're never going to see you again. And once Facebook realizes nobody cares about you, then you become irrelevant and they make you irrelevant. They're like, you know, we're going to make you irrelevant. You know, with Rachel's Facebook page, we reach, 300,000 people every week without having ever paid a dime to Facebook because we are only talking to moms about motherhood things and they share it and they love it. And because that Facebook's like, Oh, well, if you're going to share it, I'm going to show it to your friends and I'm going to show it to their friends. Like it's just this, it just keeps growing and growing as long as you stay focused on the reason why people were there in the first place. What it is that you do? Cause your book, should kind of be part of your mission of like, what is it you're trying to do for people? 
you know, as an overall yeah. overall thing. Yeah, I was thinking, Dan, as you were talking, there are two groups of people in the world, and one is the group, and we th this type of group is the one that we see in front of the Apple store when there's a 50% off sale and no one's been able to shop for three months, and they're just like banging down the doors and they're just going nuts and then there's everybody else that just sort of watches and shakes their head and that group that bangs down the door is your audience right so it's not i mean no. as an analogy for your audience and everybody else that's watching and shaking their head is not your audience and so what you want is you want to get your audience to the front of the line to you know to to get in to get whatever it is the information or the product or the service and you want everybody else to just sort of stay away because they're not really going to help you. It, from an ego perspective, having a half a million followers on Twitter is like, that's really cool. But, you know, if they're all, you know, 30 year old guys and your target market is women, blah, 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 blah. And those guys are not at all interested, then it doesn't do you any real good except to say, wow, I got, you know, half a million followers on Twitter. How cool am I? Yeah. And that's, that's not going to buy you a cup of coffee let alone help you in your mission, which I think is, is really important. Yeah. And your mission should always be sell the next book. Like this book should be so awesome and create an audience that people want the next one. Like that's the whole idea. Like they're just going to want the next thing. Otherwise, I mean, just think about how many people are waiting for the next Nike shoe to come out. Like there's, there's entire sites dedicated to when Nike releases their next shoe. And then there's an entire black market associated with the first release. And, you know, when did it come out? Like all, all this stuff, because there is a fan group for exactly what it is that you do. Right. As long as you do it well. And you see it everywhere. So then the trick is to be, like you said, I really like your definition of authenticity, because if everything I am doing is going to be attracting my ideal prospect my ideal customer my ideal fan then everybody else sort of falls away and what and then that grows because over the other thing that we people don't really think about too much and i think they should is we get better you know if you're spending you know five hours a day trying to figure out how to get your your ideal customer or fan to read your book after a year or two you've got it down yeah. right yeah. You know, you're a lot better. Like I tell everybody when we start out doing a podcast together, I says, you know, you may be a good speaker right now. You may be a terrible speaker right now, but I guarantee you a year from now, when you listen to our first episode, you're going to say, wow, I'm not, wasn't as good as I thought I was because you have improved so much over the year. It's not that you were bad or, or anything then you were probably really good, but we improve as we do things over and over and over again. And so I see yeah. that with, with my, uh, you know, the people I do podcasts with or Udemy courses with. It's just absolutely, I mean, it's the n greatest feeling in the world seeing somebody stumble through a course the first time. And by the time we do the 10th course, they're just winging it like super pro. And I just love it. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I know we've done over 100 events. We do eight hour workshops for bloggers and authors. And, uh, I think the hundredth, like I knew it by the back of my hand. And by that time we changed some of the topics cause some of them totally didn't resonate. And eventually, you know, it was a really well oiled machine. Exactly. how yeah. we today. Uh, But cool. another, I mean, it's going to be the same for you with your book and your marketing and knowing your audience, um, which is probably another good topic is, uh, trying to get someone to share your book. Right. There's one way to do this, in my opinion, there's one way. And that is, you know your audience so well that when they read the book, they see their own thoughts in it. And because of that, they want to share it. So when a, a mom reads one of Rachel's blog posts or, uh, or books, you know, her goal is to get a thousand likes in the first hour, which is crazy, right? Um, that's insane. That's awesome. Yeah, for every post. So um, when when it doesn't get a thousand, then she knows that either the image wasn't right, like the image just didn't capture the feeling of the post, or 
something about the post wasn't totally right because people will like it when it's people like things when it says it means I agree. It means when you like something, it's like, you know, you like the Denver Broncos football team if you like the Broncos, right? You don't like it just randomly because it says something about you. So when your book says something about you, something positive, something like, oh, I'm totally feeling this. Like, this is exactly how I feel. And women in particular know how their friends feel. They know, you know, other moms feel. They're like, you need to read this. This is totally, this is totally us. Right. Um, so yesterday I was looking online for my daughter has a car problem. And I was trying to figure out what the problem is. You know how you, when you Google that, like a car makes a whirring sound or a buzzing. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, you put the name of the car and the year, like you're trying to figure out, does somebody else have this problem and can they fix it? And I read, you know, just in the Google search results, the very first line, it only gives you like, what, 12 words before you click on it? Somebody said the words that sounded exactly like the problem I was having. Nice. So I clicked on it. I'm like, this sounds exactly like it. And what I wanted to know was, obviously, what do the people on this forum are saying about how to fix that thing? But all of the rest could have been the exact same problem. But it wasn't until I, I saw the problem from my viewpoint in print. Like, yes, this is, this is exactly the problem. This is how, this is how I see it or describe it. Right. And I thought, when I read this, it's going to be the solution to the exact problem that's in my head. And if somebody else had the same Chevy, whatever she's got, Cruise, and they had a problem, I'm going to say, hey, go read this. Because this guy knows exactly how to solve that problem. Right. So if you're going to take one of those courses, it's like, write a book in a day, right? I'm a, which I'm not a big fan. Then I feel like it's going to be very surface. Like, cause you're, you're basically going to write an outline and then you're going to take your three main topics and you're going to break each one of those down into three. And you're going to break each one of those down into three. And you're going to write a paragraph for each. And then you've got yourself like a book. It's simple, right? It sounds simple, but Will that concept get shared a million times? Because when you sell a book, you only sell it to one person. What you have to do is figure out how, when I sell this book, does the person who's reading this book then sell this book to one of their friends? Like, how do I make that happen? And the only way that happens is if you really, really know your audience and they read it and go like, Oh, this, this was exactly what, what I, what that I is such a good question to ask yourself when you're making your book, right? When you're writing your book, yeah. It's like, how, because it, because I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm not a publisher. I'm not a big author. That's authorship is not, a, you know, I'm in more of the podcast realm and it's a great question for that realm. Right. It's like, how do you get your listener to share this information? Because it's so there, but not because I'm hammering you to share, but because they're going, oh my goodness, Dan needs to hear this. So I got to get it to Dan. Yeah. Right? So in the Brave Art of Motherhood, which was our third book, and that one we did with Penguin Random House, um, we bought a thousand books on our own to put in the garage and sell ourselves for the first run. And our question was, all right, we're going to sell these to our audience, but how do we get our audience to share the book? So we decided that when we were writing the book that we're going to include a section in the book about friendship, like in the actual text how to be a better friend um, for moms. And it was basically saying, look, all of us are overwhelmed. And every single mom says, I don't really need help. But but everyone does. Everyone needs a night off. Everyone needs time. Like maybe yeah. just show up once for your friend. Like maybe that's your goal this year. 
is to show up for your friend, bring dinner, and just just do it because you're a mom too, and you know that it's hard to even ask for help. So in the book, in that section of the book, actually page 127, we put a postcard with a stamp on it. And it says, on the bottom of the postcard, I wrote in print in tiny letters, send to a friend after you read page 127. And the postcard was a quote from the book that named the book. So of our thousand books that we sent out, there were a thousand postcards that a mom was supposed to send to a friend with a quote you know, from the book, basically a promo from the book. Um, and those, because they, they had a special URL on the actual postcard itself, those turned into more sales for us. Quite a few, quite a few sales. We don't exactly know because some people ordered cases uh, to, wow. give, to give to the church or something like that. Um, what but, a great idea. But always be thinking, like, how do I extend the life of this book? And think about that now while you're writing it because you can build that into the pages. Yep. So the and it's the most natural thing. I'm reading, I'm reading. Oh, this that would be great to be able to help my friend. Oh, there's a postcard. All right, I'm going to – off he goes. And then also in the book, because it – I mean, with Penguin Random House, it's a trade paperback. So it means it's just the, it's a John Grisham-style novel size book. Um, and you know how many pictures are in that kind of book? Yeah. Um, not so, many. Yeah. So, so at the end of the book – we actually included the, an entire page that said, you know, if you want to see some of the pictures from Rachel's journey from her life, then you can go to findingjoy.net slash visual journey, I think. Another way for us to extend the life of the book, get people to go back to the website with a practical way. Right. You know, like not a go get this thing, but a practical, hey, like some of these stories you really resonated with, like there's the actual pictures. The right. church to or the truck that was impounded you know whatever the story was you can go see the visual journey at her, at her side. so did you have one page and it was sort of coordinated with the book like this is chapter one this is the image from chapter one page 14 or something yes. like that yeah nice uh, i think we didn't do that chapter one I, I i think we didn't do that but we did do we did do from chapter one rachel talks about her church uh, and then th this is the church that you went to, and then a little bit more about going to the church that's not in the book. But I don't think we did the, ch the page numbers. And then that led to, uh, you know, it was like page by page because we want ad revenue. You um, had to press next to go to the next visual image. Right. And right. then at the end it was, you know, if you'd like to get a free copy of the the uh, Brave Motherhood ebook, which is a totally different book. Um, then we collected email addresses that way because you don't really, you can't really collect email addresses if they buy it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Right, right. So how do you build a model? That's a great way to do it. That's a great way to do it. Huh? Awesome, Dan. You've shared some really excellent uh, tips and strategies. I want to thank you so much for being on the show, and I don't want us to leave without you taking a few minutes and talking about BC Stack. So oh. uh, I know we're coming. We're coming to the end. This is a bit, a little bit of a shift, maybe. But I've been involved with BC Stack for I think three, maybe four years now, and I just think it's a wonderful promotion that you you put out every year. So let everyone know a little bit about it. So this this is our sixth year. We're doing uh, this product we call BC Stack, um, and we take the original idea of it was when we were down in New Zealand doing a workshop. We mentioned some of the experts, like Gary Vaynerchuk, that people know pretty regularly in the United States. And people didn't know them down there. And I thought, that's really strange, because I thought the internet was like the great equalizer. Um, so on the way home, we thought, what if we introduced our experts to them and their experts to our people so that everyone can meet new people and get new ideas? Because there's all kinds of ideas there that we weren't doing here. And that seemed strange to me. Um, and then when you know when you're in Facebook group, Facebook groups here, everybody has the same questions. And it's always the same answers. Like where's the new ideas? So every year we take 65 experts that know about digital marketing, book marketing, uh, video marketing, podcasts, blog. We take a product from each and we put them into this bundle, and then we sell that bundle for $39. And this year it's the week of 
July 19th. Uh, and it's just one week. And for uh, the contributors, the people who give us the products, I mean, they sell these products. So there's a whole lot of, you know, there's a long conversations to convince them to be part of the stack, you know, to get the exposure. Um, but otherwise, even, you know, with, with Scott, who's been, who's been in it for several years, and he's always has a different course that's, you know, fantastic that we put in it. Uh, but, you know, for the new people that don't know about it, in order to give them their best product, like, can you just give it to us? I know you usually sell it, but this is a chance for new people to learn about you. So if you'd like to get a whole lot of new ideas and meet people you've never met, uh, experts who are doing stuff that you've prob you probably never thought about, then um, the week of July 19th, BC Stack is open. It's open once a year, and then that's it. Um, that's our cool product. Yeah, and I just want to add to the 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 product, the, the courses, the the knowledge, the information in BC Stack is not somebody's freebie that they have as an opt in on their website. No these, are, these are real for sale courses with the usually the cutting edge of what the people are are into, and yeah. certainly I know that's that's the case for the, the courses that I put into it. And I just got Bond Halbert in the in the Stack this year. You know, oh, like nice! The biggest copywriter in the world. He's putting copywriting product in. I was like, holy mackerel! So nice. That was an hour conversation yesterday. <laughs> and I was like, please, um, please, please! He's so awesome. <laughs> way to go! So head over. Can, is BC Stack ready now? Yeah, you can actually pre-buy it because I forgot to take that down. Okay, good, <laughs> awesome. So I really highly recommend go over to bcstack.com, join. Buy the package. Yeah. You're going to get thousands of dollars worth of, not worth of value, worth of savings, because that's what it would cost you to get these if you weren't part of, if you didn't join through the stack. Yeah. And it gets my highest recommendation. Actually, I think the biggest benefit is there are courses that you would never buy because people are so stingy with their money like oh i don't i'd love to have that but but i can't like i like they can't get over themselves like i can't spend that money because i just can't spend money on myself so there's stuff like even a facebook ads course that you probably you just couldn't get yourself to buy because you couldn't spend 400 dollars on a facebook ads course but you know you get it here for total all 39 so for me it's like i mean all that stuff that you wish that you could get, but you can't convince yourself to spend money on yourself. This is the one time that we get a chance to do it. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Really having you on here. And uh, I'll, I'm going to invite you to come back again after sometime after the BC Stack promotion is going to go the time because I'd love to delve into more on the book publishing and book writing and and you're an expert on that. Thank you. Anytime, man. I appreciate it. Love seeing you again. Oops. Thanks for joining us, everybody. This has been Books Cafe, presented by free-ebooks.net. Head over if you're not already a member. Join. You get free three, sorry, five free ebooks a month. And uh, we've got 40,000 books for you to read. We've got over 10,000 audio books for you to listen to. And uh, we're encouraging brand new authors to join and put some of their books up on our site to help build their community. And this is a way for you to get access to new up and coming authors and read some of their stories before they become super well known and big. And if you're an author, it's a way for you to grow your community. We have over 2.5 million members and, uh, they're always looking for new books to read, especially in today's time. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.